Hello, how have you been? I'm happy you found the time to join us. Do you know what we celebrate across the globe every March? That's right, March is the International Women's Month. For our read aloud session, we'll introduce you to a wonderful Filipino woman. Her name is Agaseli Limcajo Dance. She was just in grade school when World War II happened, but it was then that she discovered her passion for art. We can say she grew up really well as she has become one of our country's most prominent visual artists. For a quick introduction, let's listen to her granddaughter, a teacher for creative writing in the University of the Philippines and an award-winning author, Gabriela Dance The Delicate Strength of My Grandmother When I was younger, I thought everyone's grandmother painted. Not a lot of people can say that their grandmother is an artist, one who wields paint and brush to render the world they see on a canvas. On Sundays, when the entire clan would visit the long, low, one-story sprawl of my grandparents' home near Tomas Morato, Quezon City, I'd find my Lola Cheloy in her studio, overlooking a garden that burgeoned with bougainvilleas, galachuchis, orchids, and santans, painting on a canvas twice her height. She specialized in portraiture and still life. She especially loved capturing, in oils and acrylic, Philippine flowers interspersed with calado embroidery. You know, those fine, delicate patterns hand-sewn on Philippine fabrics woven using pineapple fibers, which eventually became the primary subject of her paintings. One could say she used photorealism as her signature style to evoke a sense of beauty in the ordinary and the everyday. Her passion for art was born out of a desire to learn from the best, and that was exactly what happened. After the Second World War, she trained under national artist Fernando Amorsolo at the University of the Philippines School of Fine Arts, where she was one of the first graduates. When she got older, she saw the value of using art as a tool to empower young people. As a well-known art educator, she established the Fine Arts Department at the Philippine Women's University and the Art Department at Ateneo de Manila Grade School, as well as spearheaded the shows I Like Art and Adventures in Art for Ateneo Educational Television. In addition to numerous awards, she accepted the 2018 Presidential Medal of Merit for her contributions to the visual arts and art education. My grandmother's strength as an artist and educator is only enhanced by her love and care for her large family. With my grandfather, Jose P. Dance Jr., who passed away in 1998, she nurtured 10, 10 children and 29 grandchildren, including me, and, as of last count, 20 great-grandchildren. Lola Cheloy recently celebrated her 90th birthday. She continues to paint every day. Para sa kanyang creative non-fiction na A Delicate Strength, The Story and Art of Araceli Limcaco Dance. Kasama rin po ngayon ni Gabriela ang paksa ng kanyang kwento, ang kanyang lola, at ang ginagalang na pintor na si Ginang Araceli Limcaco Dance. Si Gabriela Dance din po ay... Uh, ang butihing anak ng ating dating PBBY board member na si Marcy Dansley. <laughs> okay?
Thank you, Teacher Gabby. I do hope that introduction got everyone excited. Our story is Selly's Crocodile, the art and story of Araceli Limcaco Dance. As you learned from our video, the story was written by her granddaughter, Gabriela Dansley, and it won the 2019 PBBY Salanga Prize. The book illustrator is Adrian Peladero, who received the 2019 PBBY Alcala Prize for his visual interpretation of the winning story. Shall we begin? When Sally's father brought home a live crocodile from one of his business trips, he thought it was a grand choke and placed it in the family swimming pool. But Sally's mother, Mrs. Limcaco, was aghast. It had to take a siesta in order to recover her nerves. But Sally was fascinated with the crocodile. She watched it sun itself on the grass beside the pool, its scales gleaming underneath the sunlight. For Sally, the glimmering scales reminded her of pebbles glistening in the stream, or stalks of rice waving in the wind, or white lace being woven by beautiful women. Sally wondered how something so mighty could look so graceful. One evening, Sally asked her mother if she could go down to the pool so she could draw the crocodile. But Le Mrs. Limcaco shook her head. That crocodile better be leaving soon if I had anything to do about it. Besides, women don't draw or paint. It will get their hands dirty. <laughs> but Sally was undaunted. She watched her uncle and brother draw the cartoonish characters during the long summer afternoons. With her own pencil in hand, she started imitating what her uncle and brother were drawing. Slowly, her scribbles took shape and her lines began to smoothen and transform. Soon, the empty pages of her old school notebooks gave way to the character sketches of Mickey Mouse, and Shirley Temple, as well as, as well as other cartoons that Sally watched on television. Soon after, her father took the crocodile outside the family compound. They never saw it again. Sally looked at her drawing of the crocodile, which she kept with all of her other drawings, and wondered how she could capture the things that only she saw. The mountain-like ridges on the crocodile's back, the river in curve of its tail, and its gleaming stalactite teeth. With the crocodile gone, Mrs. Lumkako thought that the girls could return to swimming and Sally would finally put down her pencils. But Sally couldn't stop. She drew on backs up back of receipts and loose pages of recipe books, filling the blank spaces with comics and cartoons and celebrity faces. One day, while Sally was practicing her sketches on scraps of paper, she noticed her father watching her. She looked up when he asked, would you like to learn more about being an artist? Sally nodded excitedly. So her father enrolled her in art lessons at Santa Rosa College in Intramugos. The classes run by the Sisters of Charity were for girls who needed extracurricular activities, such as painting, sewing, and cooking. Mrs. Limcaco disapproved of the art lessons, but her father felt that Sally needed more guidance than what their family could provide. Sally needed another teacher, someone who could help her achieve even more than she could at home. Sally dove into her art lessons with a passion. She was the only child in a classroom filled with adults who were learning how to draw like her. Maestro Fernandez taught in the realist style. The canvas would be divided into a grid 
and the artist would painstakingly reproduce the object in front of her as accurately as possible. If the apple was red, then the painted apple needed to be red too. Sally was able to quickly apply the lessons her teacher taught her, and she earned praise from Maestro Fernandez. In 1942, when Sally was 12 years old, the war came. The Japanese army invaded Manila, driving out many Filipino families from the city. When the Japanese began bombing the city's airport, Sally's father shuttered their house in Pasay and moved the family to Malate. They opened a flower shop. Sally traded her pencils and paper for stems and blooms. Her fingers putting together floral arrangements for churches and small bouquets for families. But as more and more people fled from the encroaching Japanese army, the flower shop lost its customers and had to close. Schools began to close around the city, and soon Sally and her siblings were also forced to stop attending classes. The few schools that were allowed to remain open were required to shift the lessons from English to Japanese. And the students had to promise allegiance to the flag of Japan. Soldiers were ready to use their guns and bayonets at the first sign of rebellion. As the list of atrocities that the Japanese invaders inflicted on the Filipinos grew, Sally felt a fire burn inside her. She wanted to do something to show that she was angry. She was angry about being taken out of school, out of her art lessons, out of the house where she and her siblings grew up, out of everything that had meant home to her. Perhaps this was how the crocodile felt, she thought. He was taken out of his home and brought to their swimming pool where it did not belong. But unlike the crocodile, she did not want to disappear. She wanted to remain right where she was. Word had begun circulating about underground action against the Japanese military. Men who served with the Yusafe or who were trained in military schools, which were shuttered just before the Japanese invasion, had escaped to their surrounding countryside. Because of their training, they began organizing themselves into guerrilla teams. The Hook Balhap, or the Hooks as they are called, began to recruit men and women to resist the Japanese army however they could. Several Hook guerrilla leaders have heard of Sally's talent in drawing. They invited her to create comic strips that would remind people that there was hope and that guerrillas were fighting to stop the Japanese from conquering the rest of the Philippine archipelago. Although her parents were cautious about the invitation, Sally eagerly agreed to draw for the hooks. Over the next few months, Sally drew pages and pages of comic strips for the guerrillas to distribute across Manila, even reaching provinces such as Laguna in Batangas. They smuggled art materials for her so she could create stories about how the ordinary person could stand up against an army of invaders. But soon, the neighborhood whispers started. Someone in the Limcacos household was helping the guerrillas fight the Japanese. One summer morning in 1943, while Sally and her sister were, sisters were folding laundry and ironing the clothes, and her mother and brother were tending to the yard, they heard the loud clump, clump, clump of sturdy boots arriving at the front door. It was the Kempei Tai. The Japanese intelligence officers who investigated households for books and papers or drawings that showcased resistance against the Japanese. Mrs. Limkako had the children stand in the living room while the Kempei Tai rummaged through their belongings. Sally held her breath as she watched the officers ransack their closets and bookshelves 
looking for anything suspicious. Her hands grew cold. She knew that if her drawings were discovered, her entire family would be in terrible danger. The Kempe Thai officer's eyes were sharp as crocodile teeth, and their boots were as taut and strong as crocodile's jaws. No matter how hard she looked, there was nothing beautiful about these men. Sally, whispered Reuben, why did you hide your art? I threw them away, she whispered back. The Kempe Thai continued their search, overturning the furniture and tossing the family's meager possessions out of cabinets and trunks where they could not find anything they left in a huff. Sally's mother began to pick up the discarded items from the floor while her brothers and sisters helped each other straighten the furniture. Sally ran inside the bedroom she shared with her sisters. The family's ironing board had fallen askew on the floor. She peeled away the cloth cover of the board where she had hidden the comics. Just before the Kempeitai arrived, she clapped her hands around her drawings, thankful that they were not discovered. After that frightening experience, Mrs. Limpapo moved her family out of Manila to Paete Laguna, which is famous for arts and crafts. There, Sally once more took up her pencil and paper. She drew the natural beauty around her, the sunlight on the leaves, the carabaos gently grazing in the fields, the flowers blooming wherever she turned. She saw that even the simplest objects could be drawn, that there was value in the everyday things that surrounded them. And although they lived a simple and meager life, they were all still together. But it was not meant to last. During the last days of the war, Sally and her family returned to Manila. They saw entire buildings wiped out by strike planes. The air smelled of smoke and rotting bodies. Sally and her siblings hid in foxholes under the cover of darkness, hiding from the Japanese soldiers as they retreated with their bombs and bayonets. On September 2, 1945, the war ended. As Manila began to recover from the destruction, Sally returned to school. She was 16 years old. The war was very different. The world was very different now. Her mother and father have decided to live apart. And now she had to help out with the household expenses. She had nothing else but art and her art saved her once more. She began drawing portraits of American soldiers who had returned to help liberate the Philippines from the Japanese. They paid her 20 pesos for her drawings and sent them to their mothers with stories about the young girl who survived the war and drew portraits for a small fee. In gratitude, the mothers in America sent Sally art materials so she could continue drawing and making money for her family. Sally realized that she was making enough money to help pay for her family's bills and put herself through school. Her art was needed in times of peace and in times of war. After all, there was beauty to be captured wherever she looked. The lovely intricate lace shawls worn by young women as they attended church, the smiling face of a GI soldier ready to return home after the war, gumamelas blooming in the family garden, and the shining scales on a crocodile's back. And that's our story. 
Sally's Crocodile, The Art and Story of Araceli Limpaco Dance, written by Gabriela Dansley and illustrated by Adrian Panadero. <laughs>